So today I'm going to talk about the role of nature in cities and how together we need to begin to rebuild our shared ecological infrastructures. Because you see, America's coastal ecosystems are disappearing. Together, we're, they're facing these combined threats of storm surge, water quality deterioration, sea level rise, dredging, and increased wave action. What is at risk is not only the critical uh, network of shoals, shallows, and offshore islands that form this system of coastal ecosystems, but the places that we live and work itself. This has been the focus of my work over the past years, this critical relationship and reimagining the relationship between water and cities. The question becomes, how to design for a water-rich future. Because whether you live in New Orleans, Miami, or New York City, this relationship is changing, and it's changing fast. So the question becomes, how to design to reduce fragility in the systems and increase the perception of risk, and how to begin to intervene at a landscape scale. Because levees and walls block our perception and our understanding of oncoming floodwaters. They create singular line of defenses that can be overtopped in, in one moment, suddenly and catastrophically. We need to thicken our landscape. We need to focus on building physical resiliency in the physical form of the shallows. And we need to also jointly focus on the social resiliency of communities onshore. So this approach was actually formulated in a project um, called Oyster Texture, which I developed in 2009. We learned from the Gowanus. And I was really inspired by the sort of historic geomorphology of the Gowanus itself, the system of tidal flats, shoals, and bays, and offshore islands that actually protected upland inland settlement. This project evolved to propose a new landscape, one with offshore reefs and onshore kind of filtration systems that together cleaned and filtered the water and created a new relationship with that water. It was also informed by the life cycle of the oyster itself. I was really inspired by the kind of multiple properties of this, is this amazing animal. It can not only filter water, um, it can also agglomerate to form shoals and reefs and attenuate waves. So we ultimately proposed a kind of community building, reef building project. But when you start to think about these massive issues at a sort of global, national, or even regional square, scale, the question of where to start can sometimes be kind of paralyzing. So where do we start? Again, you find me in the shallows, this kind of, re, uh, this, this sort of thick um, mosaic of bathymetry that is at the same time so critical, but also so threatened. But not only do I want to kind of begin to reimagine and reclaim the ecology of this as an ecosystem, we need to begin to look at these ecosystems with new, a new mindset, one which involves jointly thinking about coastal protection. Layers of dunes and berms, constructed reefs, flats, dredge wetlands, friction forests, and habitat breakwaters can form a thicker, layered approach, one with multiple lines of defense that can span from onshore to in-water interventions. But how do we know if these systems work, and how do they perform? My office, SCAPE, has been working with the Stevens Institute over the past years to map, model, and test a diverse range of bathymetric modifications in the New York Harbor. We've been amazed at how successful and effective these interventions are, especially when combined. For example, in Staten Island, we imagined sort of an offshore uh, subtidal reef, and this reef and a system of breakwaters actually began to reduce wave action on shore by up to four feet. We also found that these systems in combination work incredibly effectively at vulnerable communities all around the harbor. Habitat breakwaters or subtidal reefs, as in the section shown here, can be also modified and, and diversified in their design to create special niches for marine uh, life to thrive, whether it's oysters or mussels or crabs or eelgrass or lobsters, special niches, and, and this, these ecosystems can begin to combine and create a landscape that is richly textured, one that does not block our view and our relationship with the water, one that makes a safer relationship with that water, and that one, one that creates an environmental context where plants and animal life can thrive once again. 
edges can be stepped and absorptive. In our nation's bays, and particularly here in our region, in Jamaica Bay, you can see this once thick and 3D mosaic of bathymetry and topography and the threats from long-term sea level rise and how that bathymetry is, is, is moving towards a system of open water. We can begin to combine these physical strategies in the bay and we can integrate these physical strategies with onshore, uh, with onshore educational programs. So this is the new framework how can we bring together large-scale strategic planning that's science-driven and combine that with ground-up initiatives and actions in our communities and where we live? There are great examples in this region. For example, the Harvard School, their oyster gardening project and our partners on many of these projects. And here you can see in this image, local volunteers planting Spartina grass, looks like high school students in fact, on an island that in fact the United States Army Corps of Engineers had just recently made. So it's this framework of larger scale planning and participatory ground up restoration that I find so exciting. Here in the Gowanus, uh, despite a legacy of pollution, it's actually cleaner than you might think. Tufts of Spartina grass line its edges. And a little farther out on Pier 5 in the Gowanus Bay, this is actually a, a pier that's falling into the water and deteriorating, creating a kind of almost accidental intertidal habitat. I've seen huge colonies of blue mussels colonizing the cracks and crevices uh, between the, the, the falling piers. I've also seen horseshoe crabs mating in <laughs> the shoals and sediment <laughs> that line its edges. Closer to home, closer to the, the mouth of the Gowanus at the 29th Street Pier, SCAPE has devised a project, a pilot project, to test for the presence of blue mussels in the waters right outside the door here. We came up with a strategy of intertidal and subtidal panels, and we're going to uh, lay these panels into the water and see what we find. Uh, to make these tapestries or panels, at the SCAPE office, we hosted a fuzzy rope weaving evening <laughs> and brought together uh, uh, neighbors and friends and volunteers and, and handed out uh, lots of fuzzy rope, how to, how to, uh, how to uh, uh, brochures, and yes, copious refreshments. So a few beers later, I mean a few hours later, we, we devised this group, which is a sort of a modern day knitting party, uh, devised 14 panels that were eventually lowered off the pier in the Gowanus Bay. And look what we found, strands and strands of blue mussels. And not only did we find mussels, we found a whole host of other species, which seemingly uh, ex uh, ex expanded exponentially with every uh, moment that we monitored them. So we went from barnacles to tunicates to mussels to fish to even crabs. So we can do it. <laughs> this is my methodology. This is my philosophy. I imagine that we can bring together large-scale strategic planning initiatives and science-driven visionary designs together with these ground-up community actions and immediate, immediate actions. And together, we can rebuild, um, transform, and reclaim our urban ecosystems. Thanks.